and recently I put an ad in the Australian Medical Journal um, on the medical dangers of nuclear power, which is the original ad I had put in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1979. Um, but the unions are interested in, in helping um, fund that ad as a continuing process for maybe the next six months. Put it in issue after issue of the Australian Medical Journal. And I'm starting to work with unions. In fact, the Electrical Trades Union has just produced a wonderful film called When the Dust Settles about uranium mining and the dangers to the miners and their families. It's 37 minutes long. It'll be up on YouTube soon. And we want to send a copy of that out to possibly the 63,000 registered doctors in Australia, to most of the MPs in Parliament, um, and to probably many unions. Um, in fact, I'm posting a whole lot today to union heads, union chiefs. Um, so that's exciting because the way I helped to stop uranium mining in the 70s was to work with the unions and it was the unions who brought about through just basic education about their genes and their sperm and cancer and deformed children, basic education um, and they banned uranium mining, the ACTU for five years till Bob Hawke opened up the free mine policy for which I will never forgive him. Uh, so that's, that's ongoing, that's quite exciting. I've got a, an organisation called People for Nuclear Free Australia who is helping to fund these ads and uh, working with the unions and we've got a website called nuclearfree.com.au. At the same time I'm setting up a new institute in America called the Helen Caldercott Foundation for a Nuclear Free Planet. And the aim of that is to reach to the youth in generations X, Y and Z know really nothing about the medical dangers of nuclear power or nuclear war. They're virtually unconscious. And how do you get to them? Well, they don't read newspapers, they don't read books, they don't watch the evening news, but they Twitter and they dig and they blog and they Facebook. And so we're setting up a really big new webpage called nuclearfreeplanet.org and it's actually, it's, it's online now in order to put up the most important articles and with we're going to connect with YouTube and blogging and get the top people in America to contribute to the website and to blog and the like. Uh, and so we're I think pretty excited and, and I'm getting funding for that which is very good and I've got a wonderful woman in America who is setting up the website with, um, with someone here, a very good uh, technologist. So that's kind of exciting too. I feel like I'm not standing still but maybe we're moving forward. If we can get the kids involved, oh and we're going to produce um, educational packets for universities and once the university gets turned on then they blog their friends and Twitter and then maybe we can start a real grassroots movement among the, the youth in America. That's my aim. And to stop uranium mining here through the unions. Please join with me in sending a prayer or a compassionate thought to the victims of radiation and war everywhere. Now there is a lot wrong with the world, but we can only fix one thing at a time. We must focus on the single biggest, most immediate threat to mankind, which is, without any doubt, nuclear explosions, contamination and fallout radiation. Dr. Helen Caldercott has worked tirelessly for 40 years to lobby governments and educate people about the dangers of the nuclear industry. She can't do it alone. The first step to solving any problem is understanding its magnitude. 
Hopefully this presentation has helped you see that this is the biggest threat not only to the current generation of human lives, but for life on Earth for millennia to come, and that this is the area we need to devote our primary effort to fixing. Japan's meltdown is not the first horrendous nuclear accident, nor is it likely to be the last. It's a wake-up call that the costs of nuclear power far exceed the benefits. It is a basic human right to live in a world without the medical dangers of radiation. We must end this nuclear nonsense now. They did a bad, bad thing. They're dumping 7.5 million times safe levels of a uh, cocktail of radioactive poisons into the Pacific Ocean. Um, this New York Times article does have buried that the government and Japanese report says that they did, did spray fuel rods everywhere, that they're just bulldozing upwards of a mile away, not even picking them up. They're just burying them on the spot. I mean, this is insane. Not even marking where they're at. This just shows the ham-fisted, not caring attitude of these people. And why not? They can just say radiation is now good for you and raise it. 25,000 times with one isotope, 10,000 times with another. And that's all in the news. The EPA just calmly reporting it like it's no big deal. And then we're the alarmist conspiracy theorists for being concerned. The peak body of science, the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, came out with a report several years ago to say that no dose of radiation is safe. No dose of radiation is safe. And each dose you get adds to your risk of getting cancer or having your genes changed in your sperm or eggs to produce deformed or diseased children. No safe level of radiation exposure. That's what the science is telling us. The mining companies, however, supported by the politicians, have a different view. What do you think? Whenever you have the opportunity to exercise, you know, any political speech, you should. Because these guys also still have to get elected. And, and until they finish hijacking the election process uh, entirely, we, we really have to defend the republic. So we're going to close down. So we'll end the nuclear age in five years. Is that optimistic? Is that naive? If I have a patient with meningococcal septicemia and they come into the casualty department, they're covered with red spots. If I don't give them an injection of penicillin right now, they'll die. And there's no, well, maybe we can, maybe we should, let's have a meeting, do a study. Patient's dead. And we are in the intensive care unit, I kid you not. But I believe if people get focused on this, their eyes start opening and the scales fall off and their peripheral vision opens up and they start saying who's doing this and why and how, and they will get the corporations out of the government, out of the Congress, out of the Senate and out of the White House, where they have no right to be. Every state in this country has a law to deregister a corporation if they behave in irresponsible or immoral ways, and that could that could be used, that law. But more than that, you need another revolution. And I don't mean blood and guts. I mean peaceful, sagacious, led by Jones of Arc and Martin Luther Kings, and you're all here. And you can't just say, well, I've got a full tummy and I'm busy and I can't do it. Every morning you get up and look in the mirror and say, what am I going to do today to save the planet? Don't do little things either. Do big things. I gave a talk like this 15 years ago. A woman called Joan Vauquer heard me talk, and she knew in the depth of her soul that what I said was right. And she became so depressed. You know when you're so depressed your joints ache? She couldn't get out of bed for about two years. And one day she woke up and the light turned on in her head. She went, put on her best shoes, pearls, and went to the Heritage Foundation and knocked on the door. And they said, hello, who are you? And she said, I'm Joan. She got a job there for a year, well paid. And when they went home at night, she went through all their records to see where their funding came from, what their policies were, peace through strength, first strike nuclear war, winnable nuclear war. At the end of a year, she said, thank you very much. And then she became Joan of Arc. She didn't have a horse, but she set off on a crusade right across America, speaking in hundreds or thousands of churches and synagogues across America, telling the American people about the Heritage Foundation.
Now, I can tell you hundreds of similar stories, but everyone has a, their own answer to what must be done, and that's the magic, the heterogeneity. And Americans are really kind and really loving and really want to do the right thing, and I know that you have the capacity, if you have the courage and don't need approval from anyone and stop being so frightfully nice but speak the truth that you can save the planet. So that's your mandate, and I leave that with you tonight. Thank you. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they have committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Well, thanks very much, Helen. And if you had some final words for peace activists around the world, what advice would you give them? Final words. I, I'll, I'll paraphrase Martin Luther King, who said, if you don't have something worth dying for, you're not really living. And I think that's true. And I had eight death threats. And I used to run off the stage when people stood up with funny things in their pockets, you know. Um, you have to be prepared to do that. I mean, what, what else can you do when you look at this? Yes. It's beautiful. Let's hope we can leave some of it behind in reasonable shape for our future generations. Yeah. Okay. Okay, do you want to come Thanks to tea? Oh, it'd be lovely. Thanks, yeah. Have you had any lunch? No, I haven't actually. Um. <laughs>